Book Three, Chapter Two of Kipps by H. G. Wells. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anthony Ogus. One. The Kippses sat at their midday dinner table and amidst the vestiges of rhubarb pie and discussed two postcards the one o'clock post had brought. It was a rare bright moment of sunshine in a wet and windy day in the march that followed their marriage. Kipps was attired in a suit of brown with a tie of fashionable green, while Anne wore one of those picturesque loose robes that are usually associated with sandals and advanced ideas. But there weren't any sandals on Anne or any advanced ideas, and the robe had come quite recently through the counsels of Mrs. Sid Pornick. "'It's art-like,' said Kipps, giving way. "'It's more comfortable,' said Anne. The room looked out by French windows upon a little patch of green and the Hythe Parade. The parade was all shiny wet with rain, and the green-grey sea tumbled and tumbled between parade and sky. The Kipps furniture, except for certain chrome lithographs of Kipps' incidental choice that struck a quiet note amidst the wallpaper, had been tactfully forced by an expert salesman, and it was in a style of mediocre elegance. There was a sideboard of carved oak that had only one fault. It reminded Kipps at times of wood carving, and its panel of bevelled glass now reflected the back of his head. On its shelf were two books from Parsons' library, each with a place marked by a slip of paper. Neither of the Kippses could have told you the title of either book they read, much less the author's name. There was an ebonised overmantel set with files and pots of brilliant colour, each duplicated by looking-glass, and bearing also a pair of Chinese jars made in Birmingham, a wedding present from Mr. and Mrs. Sidney Pornick, and several sumptuous Japanese fans. And there was a turkey carpet of great richness. In addition to these modern exploits of Messrs. Bunt and Bubble, there were two inactive tall clocks, whose extreme dilapidation appealed to the connoisseur. A terrestrial and celestial globe, the latter deeply indented, a number of good old iron-moulded and dusty books, and a stuffed owl wanting one easily replaceable glass eye obtained by the exertions of Uncle Kipps. The table equipage was as much as possible like Mrs. Bindon Botting's, only more costly, and in addition there were green and crimson wine glasses, though the Kippses never drank wine. Kipps turned to the more legible of his two postcards again. "'Unavoidably prevented from seeing me today,' he says. "'I like his cheek, after I gave him his start and everything.' He blew. "'He certainly treats you a bit off and said Anne. Kipps gave vent to his dislike of young Walshingham. "'He's getting too big for his breeches,' he said. "'I'm beginning to wish she had brought an action for breach. "'Ever since he said she wouldn't, "'he seemed to think I've got no right to spend my own money.' "'He's never like your building the house,' said Anne. Kipps displayed wrath. "'What the goodness has it got to do with him?' "'Overman, indeed.' "'Overmantle. He tries that on with me. "'I'll tell him something he won't like.' He took up the second card. "'Dashed if I can read a word of it. "'I can just make out Chitlow at the end, and that's all.' He scrutinised it. "'It's like someone in a fit writing. "'This here might be... W H A T what? P R I C E. I got it. What price are he now? It was a sort of saying of his. I expect he's either done something or not done something towards starting that play, Anne. I expect that's about it, said Anne. Kipps grunted with effort. I can't read the rest, he said at last. No how. A thoroughly annoying post. He pitched the card on the table, stood up, and went to the window, where Anne, after a momentary reconnaissance at Chitterlow's hieroglyphics, came to join him. "'Wonder what I shall do this afternoon,' said Kipps, with his hands deep in his pockets. He produced and lit a cigarette. "'Go for a walk, I suppose,' said Anne. "'I've been for a walk this morning. "'Suppose I might go for another,' he added, after an interval." They regarded the windy waste of sea for a space. "'Wonder why it is he won't see me,' said Kipps, returning to the problem of young Walshingham. "'It's all lies about his being too busy.' 
Anne offered no solution. "'Rain again,' said Kipps, as the lash of the little drop stung the window. "'Oh, bother,' said Kipps. "'You've got to do something. Look here, Anne. I'll go off for a regular tramp through the rain, up by Saltwood, round by Newington, over the camp, and so round and back, and see how they're getting on about the house, see? And look here, you get Gwendolyn to go out a bit before I come back. If it's still rainy, she can easy go round and see her sister.' Then we'll have a bit of tea with tea cake, all buttery, see? Toast it ourselves, perhaps, eh? I dare say I can find something to do in the house, said Anne, considering. You'll take your Macintosh and leggings, I suppose. You get wet without your Macintosh over all these roads. Right-o, said Kipps, and went to ask Gwendolyn for his brown leggings and his other pair of boots. 2. Things conspired to demoralise Kipps that afternoon. When he got outside the house, everything looked so wet under the drive of the south-wester that he abandoned the prospect of the clay lanes towards Newington altogether and turned east to Folkestone along the Seabrook Deeg. His Mackintosh flapped about him, the rain stung his cheek. For a time he felt a hardy man. And then as abruptly the rain ceased and the wind fell, and before he was through Sandgate High Street it was a bright spring day, and there was Kipps in his Mackintosh and squeaky leggings, looking like a fool. Inertia carried him another mile to the Lees, and there the whole world was pretending there had never been such a thing as rain, ever. There wasn't a cloud in the sky. Except for an occasional puddle, the asphalt paths looked as dry as a bone. A smartly dressed man in one of those overcoats that look like ordinary cloth and are really most deceitfully and unfairly waterproof passed him and glanced at the stiff folds of his Macintosh. Damn, said Kipps. His Macintosh swished against his leggings, his leggings piped and whistled over his boot tops. Why do I never get anything right? Kipps asked of a bright implacable universe. Nice old ladies passed him, refined people with tidy umbrellas, bright, beautiful, supercilious-looking children. Of course, the right thing for such a day as this was a light overcoat and an umbrella. A child might have known that. He had them at home, but how could one explain that? He decided to turn down by the Harvey Monument and escape through Clifton Gardens towards the hills. And thereby he came upon Coote. He already felt the most abject and propitiatory of social outcasts when he came upon Coote, and Coote finished him. He passed within a yard of Coote. Coote was coming along towards the Lees, and when Kipps saw him, his legs hesitated about their office, and he seemed to himself to stagger about all over the footpath. At the sight of him, Coote started visibly. Then a sort of rigor vitae passed through his frame. His jaw protruded, and errant bubbles of air seemed to escape and run about beneath his loose skin. Seemed, I say, I am perfectly well aware that there is really connective tissue in Coot, as in all of us, to prevent anything of the sort. His eyes fixed themselves on the horizon and glazed. As he went by, Kipps could hear his even, resolute breathing. He went by and Kipps staggered on into a universe of dead cats and dust heaps, rind and ashes. Cut! Cut! It was part of the inexorable decrees of Providence that almost immediately afterwards the residuum of Kipps had to pass a very, very long and observant-looking girls' school. Kipps recovered consciousness again on the road between Shorncliffe Station and Cheriton, though he cannot remember, indeed to this day he has never attempted to remember, how he got there and he was back at certain thoughts suggested by his last night's novel reading that linked up directly with the pariah-like emotions of these last encounters. The novel lay at home upon the chiffonnier. It was one of society and politics, there is no need whatever to give the title or name the author, written with a heavy-handed thoroughness that overrode any possibility of resistance on the part of Kipps's mind. It had crushed all his poor little edifice of ideals, his dreams of a sensible, unassuming existence, of snugness, of not caring what people said, and all the rest of it to dust. It had reinstated, squarely and strongly again, the only proper conception of English social life. There was a character in the book who trifled with art, who was addicted to reading French novels, 
who dressed in a loose, careless way, who was a sorrow to his dignified, silvery-haired, politico-religious mother, and met the admonitions of bishops with a front of brass. He treated a nice girl, to whom they had got him engaged badly. He married beneath him, some low thing or other, and sank. Kipps could not escape the application of the case. He was unable to see how this sort of thing looked to decent people. He was unable to gauge the measure of the penalties due. His mind went from that to the frozen marble of Coote's visage. He deserved it. That day of remorse. Later it found him coming upon the site of his building operations and surveying it in a mood near to despair, his Macintosh over his arm. Hardly anyone was at work that day. No doubt the builders were having him in some obscure manner, and the whole place seemed a dismal and depressing litter. The builder's shed, black-lettered Wilkins Builder Hythe, looked like a stranded thing amidst a cast-up disorder of wheelbarrows and wheeling planks, and earth and sand and bricks. The foundation of the walls were trenches full of damp concrete, drying in patches. The rooms, it was incredible that they could ever be rooms, were shaped out as squares and oblongs of coarse wet grass and sorrel. They looked absurdly small, dishonestly small. What could you expect? Of course the builders were having him. Building too small, building all wrong. Using bad materials. Old Kipps had told him a wrinkle or two. The builders were having him. Young Walshingham was having him. Everybody was having him. They were having him and laughing at him because they didn't respect him. They didn't respect him because he couldn't do things right. Who could respect him? He was an outcast. He had no place in the world. He had had his chance in the world and turned his back on it. He had behaved badly. That was the phrase. Here a great house was presently to arise, a house to be paid for, a house neither he nor Anne could manage, with eleven bedrooms and four disrespectful servants having them all the time. How had it all happened, exactly? This was the end of his great fortune. What a chance he had had. If he had really carried out his first intentions and stuck to things, how much better everything might have been. If he had got a tutor, that had been in his mind originally, a special sort of tutor to show him everything right, a tutor for gentlemen of neglected education, if he had read more and attended better to what Coote had said, Coote, who had just cut him. Eleven bedrooms. What had possessed him? No one would ever come to see them. No one would ever have anything to do with them. Even his aunt cut him. His uncle treated him with half-contemptuous sufferance. He had not a friend worth counting in the world. Buggins, car shop, Pierce, shop assistants, the Pornicks, a low socialist lot. He stood among his foundations like a lonely figure among ruins. He stood among the ruins of his future, and owned himself a foolish and mistaken man. He saw himself and Anne living out their shameful lives in this great crazy place, as it would be, with everybody laughing secretly at them, and their eleven rooms, and nobody approaching them, nobody nice and right, that is, for ever. And Anne. What was the matter with Anne? She'd given up going for walks lately, got touchy and tearful, been fitful with her food, just when she didn't ought to. It was all a part of the judgment upon wrongdoing. It was all part of the social penalties that juggernaut of a novel had brought home to his mind. 3. He let himself in with his latch key. He went moodily into the dining room and got out the plans to look at them. He had a vague hope that there would prove to be only ten bedrooms, but he found there were still eleven. He became aware of Anne standing over him. "'Look here, Artie,' said Anne. He looked up and found her holding a number of white oblongs. His eyebrows rose. "'It's callers,' said Anne. He put his plans aside slowly and took and read the cards in silence with a sort of solemnity. "'Callers after all!' Then perhaps he wasn't to be left out of the world after all. Mrs. G. Porritt Smith, Miss Porritt Smith, Miss Mabel Porritt Smith, and two smaller cards of the Reverend G. Porritt Smith. Law, he said. Clergy. There was a lady, said Anne, and two grown-up girls, all dressed up. And him? 
There wasn't no him. Not, he held out the little card. No, there was a lady and two young ladies. But these cards, what are they going to leave these two little cards with the Rev G. Smith on for? Not if he wasn't with them. He wasn't with them. Not a little chap dodging about behind the others and didn't come in. I didn't see no gentleman with them at all, said Anne. Rum, said Kipps. A half-forgotten experience came back to him. I know, he said, wavering the reverend gentleman's card. He give them the slip, that's what he's done. Gone off while they were rapping before you let them in. It's a fair call, anyhow. He felt a momentary base satisfaction at his absence. What did they talk about, Anne? There was a pause. I didn't let them in, said Anne. He looked up suddenly and perceived that something unusual was the matter with Anne. Her face was flushed. Her eyes were red and hard. Didn't let them in? No, they didn't come in at all. He was too astonished for words. I answer the door, said Anne. I've been upstairs, namling the floor. How was I to think about callers, Artie? We ain't never had callers all the time we've been here. I'd seen Gwendolyn out for a breath of fresh air, and there I was upstairs, namling that floor she'd done so bad, so as to get it done before she came back. I thought I'd namel that floor and then get tea, and have it quiet with you, toast and all, before she came back. How was I to think about callers? She paused. Well, said Kipps, what them? They came and rapped. How was I to know? I thought it was a tradesman or something. Never took my apron off. Never wiped the navel off my hands. Nothing. There they was. She paused again. She was getting to the disagreeable part. What they say, said Kipps. She says, is Mrs Kipps at home? See, to me. Yes. And me all painty and no cap on or nothing. Neither missus nor servant like. There, Artie, I could have sunk through the floor with shame, I really could. I could hardly get my voice. I couldn't think of nothing to say, but just not at home. And out of habit like, I held the tray. And they gave me the cards and went. And I shall ever look that lady in the face again, I don't know. And that's all about it, Artie. They looked me up and down, they did. And then I shut the door on them. Go, said Kipps. Anne went and poked the fire needlessly with a passion, quivering hand. "'I wouldn't have had that happen for five pounds,' said Kipps. "'A clergyman and all.' Anne dropped the poker into the fender with some éclat and stood up and looked at her hot face in the glass. Kipps's disappointment grew. "'You did ought to have known better than that, Anne. You really did.' He sat forward, cards in hand, with a deepening sense of social disaster. The things were laid upon the table, toast sheltered under a cover at mid-fender, the teapot warmed beside it, and the kettle just lifted from the hob sang amidst the coals. Anne glanced at him for a moment, then stooped with the kettle holder to wet the tea. Cha, said Kipps, with his mental state developing. "'I don't see it's any use getting in a state about it now,' said Anne. "'Don't you?' "'I do. See?' Is his people, good people, want to associate with us, and here you go and slap him in the face. I didn't slap him in the face. You do, practically. You slams the door in their face, and that's all we see of them ever. I wouldn't have had this happen not for a ten-pound note. He rounded his regrets with a grunt. For a while there was silence, save for the little stir of Anne's movements preparing the tea. Tea, Artie! said Anne, handing him a cup. Kipps took it. I put sugar once, said Anne. Oh, dash it, who cares, said Kipps, taking an extraordinarily large additional lump with fury quivering fingers and putting his cup with a slight excess of force on the recessed cupboard. Who cares? I wouldn't have had this happen, he said, bidding steadily against accomplished things, for twenty pounds. He gloomed in silence through a long minute or so. Then Anne said the fatal thing that exploded him. Artie, she said. What? There's buttered toast down there by your foot. There was a pause. Husband and wife regarded one another. Buttered toast, he said. 
You go and mess up them callers, and then you try and stuff me up with buttered toast. Buttered toast, indeed. It is our first chance of knowing anyone that's all fit to associate with. Look here, Anne. Tell you what it is. You've got to return that call. Return that call? Yeah, you've got to return that call. That's what you've got to do. I know. He waved his arm vaguely towards the miscellany of books in the recess. It's in manners and rules of good society. You've got to find just how many cards to leave, and you've got to go and leave them. See? Anne's face expressed terror. But, Artie, how can I? How can you? How could you? You've got to do it anyhow. They won't know you, not in your Bond Street act. If they do, they won't say nothing. His voice assumed a note of entreaty. You must, Anne. I can't. You must. I can't and I won't. Anything in reason I'll do, but face those people again I can't, after what's happened. You won't? No. So there they go off, and we never see them again. And so it goes on. So it goes on. We don't know nobody, and we shan't know anybody. And you won't put yourself out, not a little bit, or take the trouble to find out anything how it ought to be done. Terrible pause. I never ought to have married you, Artie. That's the truth. Oh, don't go into that. I never ought to have married you, Artie. I'm not equal to the position. If you hadn't said you'd drown yourself... She choked. I don't see why you shouldn't try, Anne. I've improved. Why don't you? Instead of which you go sending out the servant and namling floors, and then when visitors come... How was I to know about your old visitors? cried Anne in a wail, and suddenly got up and fled from amidst their ruined tea, the tea of which Tosal Buttery was to be the crown and glory. Kipps watched her with a momentary consternation. Then he hardened his heart. Ought to have known better, he said, going on like that. He remained for a space rubbing his knees and muttering. He omitted scornfully, I can't and I won't. He saw her as the source of all his shames. Presently, quite mechanically, he stooped down and lifted the flowery china cover. To dash a buttered toast, he shouted at the sight of it, and clapped the cover down again hard. When Gwendolyn came back, she perceived things were in a slightly unusual poise. Kipps sat by the fire in a rigid attitude, reading a casually selected volume of the Encyclopaedia Britannica, and Anne was upstairs and inaccessible, to reappear at a later stage with reddened eyes. Before the fire, and still in a perfectly assimilable condition, was what was evidently an untouched supply of richly buttered toast under a cracked cover. "'They've had a bit of a tiff,' said Gwendolyn, attending to her duties in the kitchen, with her outdoor hat still on, and her mouth full. "'They're rummons, if ever. My eye!' and she took another piece of Anne's generously buttered toast. 4. The Kipses spoke no more that day to one another. The squabble about cards and buttered toast was as serious to them as the most rational of differences. It was all rational to them. Their sense of wrong burnt within them. Their sense of what was owing to themselves. The duty of implacability. The obstinacy of pride. In the small hours Kipps lay awake at the nadir of unhappiness and came near groaning. He saw life as an extraordinarily desolating muddle. His futile house, his social discredit, his bad behaviour to Helen, his low marriage to Anne. He became aware of something irregular in Anne's breathing. He listened. She was awake and quietly and privately sobbing. He hardened his heart. Resolutely he hardened his heart. The stupid little tragedies of these clipped and limited lives. What is the good of keeping up the idyllic sham and pretending that ill-educated, misdirected people get along very well and that all this is harmlessly funny and nothing more? You think I'm going to write fat, silly, grinning novels about half-educated, under-trained people and keep it up all the time, that the whole thing's nothing but funny? As I think of them lying unhappily there in the darkness, my vision pierces the night. See what I can see. Above them, brooding over them, I tell you there is a monster, 
a lumpish monster, like some great clumsy griffin thing, like the Crystal Palace Labyrinthodon, like Coote, like the leaden godness dullness Pope abhorred, like some fat proud flunky, like pride, like indolence, like all that is darkening and heavy and obstructive in life. It is matter and darkness, it is the anti-soul, stupidity. My Kipses live in its shadow. Shalford in his apprenticeship system, the Hastings Academy, the ideas of Coote, the ideas of the old Kipses, all the ideas that have made Kipps what he is, all these are its shadow. But for that monster there might not be groping among false ideas and hurt one another so sorely and so stupidly, but for that the glowing promise of childhood and youth might have had a happier fruition. Thought might have awakened in them to meet the thought of the world, the quickening sunshine of literature pierced to the substance of their souls. Their lives might not have been divorced, as now they are divorced for ever, from the apprehension of beauty that we favoured ones are given, the vision of the grail that makes life fine for ever. I have laughed and I laugh at these two people. I have sought to make you laugh. But I see through the darkness the souls of my Kipses as they are, as little pink strips of living stuff, like the bodies of little, ill-nourished, ailing, ignorant children, children who feel pain, who are naughty and muddled and suffer and do not understand why, and the claw of this beast rests upon them. End of chapter 2